So one of the really big systems, we're going to have a couple that are going to be longer, I guess, than others. The skin was a pretty big one. Um, cardiovascular system. There's a lot to it, and um, still more people die of cardiovascular disease than anything else. And therefore, it's a big deal um, understanding how it works, understanding all the parts. First of all, what does it do? Okay, so it's the, the heart, the blood vessels, and the way it works is that you, your heart has two sides. The left side is big and strong and pumps the, body to, the blood to your entire body. The right side then receives that used blood and pumps it through the lungs to get oxygenated. So it's like a big figure eight. The blood's always going to their lungs, then to the body, to the lungs, and then to the body. And the pressures have to balance out. You know, if one side starts to fail, the other side pushes blood into an area that it can't come out of because the, the other side has failed, and therefore you'll build up pressures in there. It can cause your lungs to fill with fluid, pulmonary edema like we talked about. It can cause um, the wall of the heart to enlarge in its attempts to pump harder and result in heart failure. The uh, blood vessels start out, everything leaving the heart goes out an artery. Arteries are outgoing vessels. And they break down into smaller and smaller arteries. Then they um, reach the arterioles, which are little constricting blood vessels, kind of like the bronchioles were in the lungs, that can close off blood to an area if you need it to go somewhere else. Then it goes through capillary beds where all the exchange takes place, and it comes back on the, through the veins, winding up at the vena cava and back into the heart. The biggest blood vessel leaving the heart is the aorta, so we're going to have a number of aortic problems. Then you're just going to have some arterial problems. Then you might have some problems in the capillary beds. You're going to have some venous problems, and then back to the heart, and then the chambers of the heart can have their own set of problems. Two pumps off, uh, simultaneous. Right side is pulmonary. It goes to the lungs. The pulmonary side. Remember, pulmono is the lungs anyway. Left side is systemic. It goes to all the systems of the body. You're taking oxygen. You're taking nutrients. You're controlling, controlling fluid balance in the tissues by either uh, filtering out more fluid out of the capillaries to add fluid to the tissues or absorbing it back. You're controlling your body temperature by taking the, the blood to the surface of the skin where heat can be evaporated away through your, your sweat mechanism. It takes hormones to every part of your body to turn on and off and regulate the actions of all of your tissues. And, of course, it goes through the kidneys and filters through those nephrons, produces urine, which takes the waste products out of your blood and then returns what you want back into the blood. So all of those things are part of the cardiovascular system. Not only that, the lymphatic system is considered part of the cardiovascular system although it's also part of the immune system because the lymphatic system goes through the lymph nodes. The lymphatic system has blood vessels or lymph vessels in all of the capillary beds that take out the excess fluid, take out any debris. They um, can take pretty big things like cancer cells and stuff that normally can't get into a blood vessel because the vessel walls don't have big holes in them takes all that stuff, sucks it out of there, brings it up through the lymph nodes, which are chock full of immune cells, to try to kill anything bad before dumping it back into the circulation. So that's yet another part of our system here. Let's look at the heart first. You have two atria. The upper chambers are, one is an atrium, two are atria. And so you have the left and right. Remember, you're looking at your patient. So this is their left and this is their right. 
So that's the left atrium, the right atrium. The bigger chambers down below are the ventricles, the left and right ventricle. This takes uh, oxygenated blood from the lungs, drops it down into the left ventricle, pumps it out the aorta and goes to the whole body. It comes back through the vena cava into the right atrium, down into the right ventricle, and pumps out the pulmonary arteries to the lungs. So it goes out the aorta, and then it goes out the pulmonary arteries, and out the aorta, and out the pulmonary arteries. Arteries take it away. Arterioles constrict the flow. Capillaries exchange the oxygen and nutrients, and veins bring it back. High pressure here, low pressure here. That allows the blood to move in the right direction all the time. So the heart, it's a hollow muscle. It's made of cardiac muscle, not skeletal muscle and not smooth muscle like you have around your viscera, but cardiac muscle is, has its own way of, of working that's somewhat different than the other guys. Um, circulates the, it sucks the blood out of the veins and rams it into the arteries to keep the pressure low on that side and high on that side so that it moves properly. Left and right atria, left and right ventricles. The valves between the atria and ventricles are called the atria, atri, atrioventricular valves. You have two of them. On the right side you have what's called the tricuspid valve because it's got three cusps. And on the other side is the mitral valve. It's called the bicuspid valve because it has two, but most people call it the mitral valve. Most people have heard of mitral valve prolapse and problems that come with that, and that's on the left side. That's between the left atrium and the left ventricle. The valves that go out, the aortic valve goes into the aorta, and the pulmonic valve goes into the, or pulmonary valve, goes into the pulmonary artery. And they're called semilunar valves because their cusps look like half moons. So your semilunar valves are the outflow valves, aortic and pulmonary. The AV valves are the ones that allow blood to go from the atria to the ventricles. You have layers of the heart wall, just like you do in the uterine wall. You have an endocardium, which is on the inside, like the endometrium. You have a myocardium, which is the muscular layer that pumps, like the myometrium. You have the epicardium, which is on the outside. And surrounding the whole thing, you have a sac that encloses it. It's filled with fluid, and it protects the heart because it's always moving, from rubbing against everything else. It's like having two layers of socks on because it's a kind of a, a two-walled little bag that allows you, the heart, to do all kinds of stuff, especially during exercise. It moves pretty frantically without rubbing against your lungs or anything else. So that you can have a problem with your endocardium, the myocardium, the epicardium, which are part of the heart wall, or the pericardial sac also has its own set of problems. Blood vessels, arteries are strong, high pressure, kind of thick walls. The aorta, I mean arterioles are small delivery vessels that are muscular that can control it. Remember the aorta is the biggest one. The veins are the returning vessels. They're low pressure so the walls are thinner. They collapse easy. You know, if you, there's a vein on your wrist you can just easily close it off and push it down. Arteries, you'd have to push pretty hard to block off an artery. The vena cava is the largest vein. You have one coming down from the top, one from the bottom. The superior and inferior vena cava bring that blood from here back to the heart and from here back to the heart. Capillaries are where all the exchange of oxygen and nutrients take place. Transportation of nutrients, oxygen, carbon dioxide, 
waste products and hormones and control of acid-base balance. Your acidity needs to be controlled very tightly because your chemical reactions in your body only work within a pretty close tolerance of things like temperature and, um, and pH or uh, acidity of your blood. Takes the immune system all around, delivers it. It delivers clotting mechanisms. If you uh, cut a blood vessel, you can make a blood clot. Electrolyte balance, fluid balance, regulation of temperature. Blood itself is made up of clear fluid called plasma. And then the formed elements are the cells that are floating around in there. And they are erythrocytes, red blood cells, leukocytes, white blood cells, and thrombocytes are clotting your platelets. They're your clotting um, cells that start the blood clot formation process. Thrombo means clot, so clot cells are thrombocytes. Can't donate plasma. Well, uh, if I don't know, I mean, do they not let women who've had children donate at all, or women who are or Rh negative? If you have a certain um, um, style of blood, you can have AB or AB, but you also either are Rh positive or negative. If you're Rh negative and you've had a baby. If that baby was Rh positive, you have built up antibodies against that baby. And so if you give that to somebody else and they have an Rh positive baby, it may cause that baby to have problems because that, those immune, that immune response might be directed. That's the only thing I can think of why it would be. Well, you know, I mean, if, if, they, if they had the mechanism there to type your blood and stuff, they could probably go ahead and take some plasma, but they don't. Yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, if, if, you've, if you've ever had I mean, HIV, you know, if you've ever had, and if you've ever been pregnant, it could produce a problem, and so, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Lymphatic system, the lymphatic vessels that bring excess fluid and stuff back to return it back to the bloodstream, but pass it through lymphatic tissues first um, to, uh, to kill any viruses or bacteria or whatever that might be pulled out of the tissues. Moves through the lymph nodes and a couple of other things like your, your thymus and your spleen and you know various other um, structures you have that are at least partly are all lymphatic in nature. Since you don't have a heart pumping your lymph nodes, your lymph moves very slowly. It mostly moves because as you walk along, your muscles kind of squash the blood vessels and moosh the stuff back upward. So lymphatic system is slow moving. But if it gets blocked, fluid builds up in your legs and your legs can literally get this big. Lymphatic system brings blood, uh, lymph up here. You have lymph nodes at your joint areas in the groin, at the axillary area around the armpits, in your neck. Lymph itself is a colorless liquid that just is the extra fluid pulled out of your tissues. You're between your cells, you don't have blood. The blood stays in the blood vessels. It leaks out or filters fluid into the tissues to take nutrients and stuff. And then it sucks it back or reabsorbs it later so that you're constantly washing your tissues with fresh fluid. But that fluid doesn't contain red blood cells, so it's clear. It looks like plasma.
spleen is a lymphatic organ. Not entirely. It, one thing, though, it does is filters out dying or dead red blood cells. The thymus is an immune organ, too, kind of like giant lymph node in a way. Also, the lymph nodes and the thymus have a, um, a property where they take immature um, white blood cells, immune cells, and mature them. So whereas most of your um, immune cells uh, come initially from the uh, bone marrow, just like your red blood cells do, a lot of them come in an immature form to the thymus or to the uh, lymph nodes and wind up maturing there before they can do their job. So these are the bad guys. They are pathogens if they could generate a disease. They're antigens if they can generate an allergic response, anti-generators. So certainly, you know, toxins, poisons, allergens like peanuts. Cancer cells can be bad guys that your immune system can sometimes fight. The problem is your body often doesn't recognize them as being foreign cells because they're your own. They change enough that sometimes you can recognize them as being weird, so your immune system will attack them. But your immune system isn't supposed to attack your own cells, otherwise you'd be sick all the time. And so, you know, sometimes you can attack cancer cells, sometimes you can't. Bacteria and viruses, fungus, um, you know, anything. The first line of defense are the chemical barriers, which is your skin, or a me a mechanical barriers is your skin, which just keeps stuff out, and chemical barriers, which your skin produces oils and sweat that contain antibacterial agents. So does saliva have antibacterial agents and earwax and tears. You know, all of those have a, a way of killing at least a decent number of bacteria to keep you from getting infections all the time. Then a couple of layers of defense. You have some white blood cells that are always floating around, or leukocytes, and if something you know uh, enters your body and they recognize that it has something wrong with it, they'll try to eat it and kill it. And then you have, from the lymphatic system, you have lymphocytes that are released. You have the T cells, which in general, T cells go and directly inject a, a bacterium or something with a toxin or, or something that kills it. So a direct, direct reaction. Or you have the B lymphocytes, which is the final layer of your immune response, because B lymphocytes make antibodies. So when you get the flu, you get a virus, and you, get it for, you have it for a week because it takes that long. Most of these other things don't work great against viruses. They're better against bacteria. But the B lymphocytes will make a, an antibody that will be attached to the virus, and that is a signal for your other immune cells to come and eat it. So it takes a little while for that to happen. So there's a lag time between getting exposed with a cold or the flu or something before you get sick, and then there's a lag time for you to get well because it takes a while for your body to respond in this way. If you have a vaccination, what they do is put some dead viruses in you, but they still have the marker on them that causes your body to make the antibodies. And then the next time the live one shows up, you're already ready to fight it. So you may keep, keep it from proliferating so you never get sick at all. Or if you do get sick, you get well a lot faster. So, knowing all the parts now, blood vessels are angio, angioplasty. Fixing a blood vessel. Angiogenesis, growing new blood vessels. Aorto is the aorta. 
Arterio is an artery specifically, not just a blood vessel. Cardio is heart. Lymphadin O is a lymph gland or lymph node. Adin, you know, is gland. Lympho is lymph. Myelo is bone marrow. Now we're going to see this term with the spinal cord too, because myelo actually means the core or center of. So bone marrow is in the center, and your spinal cord is in the middle of your backbone. You know, so myelo is going to be used in a couple of places. But right now, myelo is bone marrow, like pilo is the renal pelvis. You know, slightly different than than uh, other words that sound like it. Flebo or veno is vein. So you know, you can have a venous problem, or you can have phlebotomy, cutting into a vein to do something, or phlebotomy uh, to just insert a you know a, a needle into your vein to draw some blood out. A phlebotomist is somebody that makes holes in veins to draw blood out. Plasmo is your plasma, spleno is your spleen, thymo is your thymus, valvo or valvulo or valve problems, ventriculo is the um, ventricles. Athero is a term that means plaque formation. We're going to learn the terms arterio, ar arteriosclerosis means hardening of the arteries. Sclerosis, anything, you know, remember the sclerosis that caused the hardening and shrinking of the, of the skin on the hands? It was a skin problem. Okay, well, arteriosclerosis is hardening of the arteries. Atherosclerosis is a hardening of the arteries due to a buildup of plaques. That's what usually happens in your heart when you get heart disease. Echo is using an ultrasound, kind of like sono. So for some reason, and we could easily have called it a sonocardiogram, but they call it an echocardiogram, the same thing. Electrocardiogram would be a, a view of the electrical activity of the heart. Isho means lack of oxygen. Ischemia or ischemia means lack of oxygen in the blood or lack of oxygen due to blood you know, loss. So ischemia in the heart means you've got a blocked artery, you're not getting enough oxygen, not enough blood. Thermo is temperature, so thermoregulation can create, uh, create heat or cold as needed. And thrombo means blood clot. That's why a thrombocyte is a clotting cell or platelet. Brady Bunch is slow. Tacky is fast. So tachycardia is a heart, fast heart rate. Bradycardia is a slow heart rate. Pan, everywhere. That's what, remember, we, you had that one. Pan means, you know, worldwide, whatever. So if you have a problem, for instance, your pituitary gland, instead of not doing everything it should do, if it doesn't do anything, it's called pan hyperpituitarism, hypopituitarism, because it can't produce any of the um, hormones it's supposed to. Related to ac, cardiac. They could have used cardiol. You know, owl we use in other systems, but they didn't. It's cardiac. Apheresis is removal of too much fluid, you know, like, you know, bleeding somebody to death. Pina means not enough. So if you have thrombocytopenia, you don't have enough clotting factors and you can't clot your blood very well. If you have 
erythrocytopenia, you don't have enough red blood cells. Leukocytopenia means you don't have enough. Poesis means to create. So in our bone marrow, we have cytopenia, I mean cytopoesis. We have erythrocytopoesis. We have hematopoesis, creation of blood, creation of red blood cells. Sclerosis, we know, means hardening. We're going to see this poesis because when you don't have enough red blood cells, your kidney releases a product called erythropoietin, and it causes your bone marrow to make more red blood cells. And, you know, athletes who want to cheat take erythropoietin shots, EPO, they call it, you know, as an ergogenic aid, and it causes them to make more red blood cells so they can carry more oxygen. Which is a vein? Flebo. Flebo. That's always been an easy one for me because I'm old enough to remember Richard Nixon, of all things. And after he went out in disgrace, it suddenly turned out that he couldn't stand trial for anything he'd done because he uh, developed uh, um, uh, vein problems. And so he had you know, thrombophlebitis and you know, various things in his leg. He may really have had phlebitis, but it seems like he didn't have it beforehand, it only afterward. Okay, so some disease parts. What would an angioma be? Tumor made out of, blo of blood vessels, right? So it's going to probably be bright colored. How about angiostenosis? Narrowing of a blood vessel. Aortic stenosis, narrowing of the aorta, or usually it's the aortic valve that won't open all the way. It gets a hardening or problem on it, and so your heart is pushing and the blood is squirting through this little opening that won't open all the way. Arteriosclerosis, not narrowing really, so this is hardening of the arteries, would be better. Atherosclerosis is hardening and narrowing because it's getting hard because it's building up plaques that are filling up the space in there. Bradycardia is heart rate below 60. Tachycardia is a heart rate over 100. Fast. There's an angioma. Blood vessel overgrowth causing a red blob. Here's atherosclerosis. Now, arteriosclerosis, it can be caused by a variety of things. One thing is just when you get age, everything gets stiff. You know, your blood vessels don't, aren't as pliable. They don't stretch as well. But atherosclerosis builds up these plaques, and it makes the wall really hard, but it also makes the hole really small. And all you got to do is get a little blood clot here, and suddenly you have a heart attack. It blocks it off the rest of the way. Cardiomegaly, enlarged heart. We have splenomegaly, and we have you know, hepatomegaly, and we have, you know, everything can become megaly, except your brain pretty much can't if you, you know, there's no room for it to go. If it starts increasing in size. As we'll see, it's, you know, the pressure goes up and can be lethal for you. Cardiomyopathy, this is a cardiac muscle disease. Endocarditis, myocarditis, pericarditis, inflammations of the various layers of the heart wall. Phlebitis, inflammation of the Richard Nixon leg, vein. Erythrocytopenia, not enough red blood cells. Hematoma, a tumor made out of blood. Big blob of blood somewhere. Leukocytopenia, not enough white blood cells. 
multiple myeloma. Well, this is bone marrow tumor. As it turns out, multiple myeloma, myeloma is a cancerous tumor. Pancytopenia, not enough of any kind of cell. You're not making enough blood cells, red, white, platelets, anything. Thrombocytopenia, not enough platelets. A throm thrombosis is a bad condition as a result of a thrombus, which is a blood clot. Lymphadenitis, inflamed lymph nodes. Lymphadenopathy, disease of the lymph nodes. Lymphoma, tumor of the, or, you know, lymphomas, sometimes they form tumors, sometimes it's throughout the lymphatic system. It's generally a cancerous, a term for a cancerous disease starting in the lymphatic system. Splenomegaly. Too big. Thymoma. Thymus gland. Here's aortic stenosis. Blood's trying to go out of the heart, but the valve is all diseased or damaged and it won't open. And so it comes squirting through. It makes a noise. It gives you a heart murmur. That's one of your heart murmurs would be aortic stenosis. What do you think? B. Yeah, remember, osis is the entire suffix there. Atherosclerosis. Variety of other heart problems you can have. Acute coronary syndrome means your heart suddenly stops working properly. It doesn't have to be exactly a heart attack. Your heart can go into fibrillation where it's just not beating well, or it can stop, or it can you know, beat only half as well as it should, or something, but it's a sudden onset and you've dropped to the ground or you turn pale and you've, you feel terrible and all that. So acute coronary syndrome. An aneurysm is like a herniation, a seal, angioseal would be another term for an aneurysm. But aneurysms get their own term because blood vessel walls have a tendency to get weak and bulge. And as they bulge, there's more pressure exerted and they have a tendency to pop. They don't heal themselves. So aneurysms, if you find one, aortic aneurysms are kind of common. Your biggest blood vessel, and it comes out the top of your heart and goes all the way down the middle of your, of your thorax and abdomen and takes blood to your major arteries, uh, to your kidneys and to your liver and your stomach and stuff, and it has, it, the wall can get weak and start to bulge out. And if it ruptures, you're dead. So you have to have it repaired if it, starts, if it gets beyond a certain point. A lot of um, aneurysms are cerebral aneurysms. People wind up with a stroke that's caused by an aneurysm bursting and then suddenly blood flow isn't going where it's supposed to. Angina pectoris, chest pains in the pectoral area, heart related. Angina pectoris from usually ischemia, not enough oxygen getting to some part of the heart muscle. An arrhythmia is an abnormal heart rhythm. rhythm. It means you don't have rhythm. I got rhythm. Atrial fibrillation is actually a pretty common uh, occurrence, in, especially in older people. And the atria, the atria are supposed to squeeze and push the blood into the ventricles. Then the ventricles squeeze to push it out. So your heart is supposed to go like this to, to beat. But the atria, after years and years of wear and tear, will lose their synchronicity and they'll start just quivering. And the blood finds its way into the ventricle, so you live, but you usually feel a little bit weak, you're a little bit tired or whatever, because it's not going in well, 
before you pump it out, and because it has a tendency to sit still for a short amount of time, it has a tendency to form blood clots. So people with AFib are always taking, um, you know, warfarin or you know, heparin or at least aspirin, you know, something to keep the uh, clots from forming and giving them a stroke. Cardiac arrest, your heart just stops. That's one version of acute coronary syndrome. That would certainly do it. Cardiac tamponade is where the pericardial sac surrounding the heart fills with blood. If you damage a blood vessel in the heart or, or one of the ventricles and blood starts squirting out into the bag, the bag will fill up and the pressure will get so high it will squish the heart and cause it to stop. And it will kill you. So on Trauma Life in the ER or any of the other TV shows, they're always bringing in guys and, oh, well, there's blood around the heart, and they stick a tube in and it squirts across the room and everybody goes, ah. And you know, what they're doing is releasing the pressure out of there. So you can have a uh, pericardial effusion, which if you have an inflammation of the pericardial sac, it can leak fluid in there and do the same thing, but it's a slower process. Or cardiac tamponade, it's filled with blood. So it can be filled with clear fluid, which can be bad, or it can fill with blood, which is faster and therefore worse. Coarctation of the aorta, there's a narrowing, a stenosis, but it's not because there's a blob in there, it's because the wall of the aorta is just kind of squished in, like somebody's pinching it with their fingers, usually in newborns and they have to surgically fix it. Congenital heart disease means you were born with it. Coronary artery disease or CAD is atherosclerosis buildup of plaques on the walls of your coronary arteries until they get blocked off. Deep vein thrombosis in, in your legs you can see the veins that are on the surface but the ones that run down the middle to, to return blood from the deeper in have a tendency to uh, form clots if the blood ever stops moving. Older people who don't have good vessel walls and they get kind of soft and stretchy and the blood hangs out longer, and especially if they sit on an airplane for eight hours crossing the, the Atlantic to see their new grandkid who was born in England or something, and they'll get up to get off the plane and drop dead of a heart attack or a stroke because they'll form a thrombus in that stationary blood. They start moving, it breaks loose and goes to their head and gives them a stroke. So deep th vein thrombosis can be a really life-threatening condition. It can happen after you have surgery and it blocks, like after my knee surgery, my lower leg was swollen for a while because it was hard for the lymph and the blood to get out of that leg and if it sat there long enough it could clot. So the very day you have the surgery they have you up walking around whether you want to or not. Yeah, yeah. Even when I had this surgery done last Thursday they put those on. They, they squash and release and squash and release. I think it was the first time I actually had those on for a surgery. And I've had a couple of other surgeries. I did have one of those that I took home with me after my knee surgery that I, I used and it had you know, cold in it and it squeezed and it relaxed and it you know did everything trying to help. Heart failure is any condition that causes your heart not to be able to pump enough blood. So heart failure if your heart just gets weak with age, or if you have a heart attack and it damages part of the muscle, you go into heart failure. Atrial fibrillation, and then the, the blood is just kind of tumbling down in here instead of squirting in before each beat. And what they do is they try to ablate or burn out the areas of the atrium that are firing without coordination so that they can get it to go back to just firing when your SA node tells you to fire, which is your pacemaker in your heart. 
aortic aneurysm. This is down in the abdominal aorta, bulging here. Coarctation of the aorta, narrowed. Some other words here, uh, uh, terms not built from word parts. Hypertensive heart disease means heart disease because you have high blood pressure. You know, if your blood pressure in that aorta is too high, your heart has to work way harder to push the blood out with every beat. Well, for a while it gets stronger, but after a while it starts to wear out, and you're likely to wind up in heart failure due to hypertension. Intermittent claudication is pain in your legs when you start exercising because you have poor blood flow to your legs. You might be diabetic. You might have peripheral vascular disease, some reason why you're not getting enough blood to your legs. There's enough blood getting there when you're sitting on the couch, but you get up and start doing stuff, and your legs become ischemic, and they start to hurt. So it's intermittent pain during exercise due to poor blood flow. And it's an indication to get something done. Ischemia, not enough blood flow to the tissue. Myocardial infarction means a heart attack. To infarct means to kill. So some of the heart muscle is dying if you're having an MI. Peripheral arterial disease, it means you're not talking about at the aorta, you're talking about in the arms and legs. Peripheral arterial disease happens to people with diabetes. Rheumatic heart disease, you have strep throat, and it spreads, if it's not treated, it, it as kind of escapes from that area, metastasizes sort of and winds up settling in your heart and can cause damage to your heart muscle and your heart valves. So if you have scarlet fever, rheumatic fever, you might wind up with rheumatic heart disease unless you treat it quickly. So often. Well, that's why they took mine out. You know, they kept trying, my, my tonsils were taken out, I was probably 8 or 10, but I had had tonsillitis over and over and over again, and, you know, it's not a good thing to have frequent infections and frequent antibiotics forever. So they finally just yanked them out. Oh, it hurts. <laughs> yeah, but it's either that or a shot. You know, and boy, did I hate shots when I was a kid. Oh, no. Varicose veins are weak, stretched out veins, usually in the lower legs. Um, most people get them with age. Women get them after pregnancy because there's so much extra fluid and extra pressure during pregnancy, it puts too much stress on the walls of the veins, and they stretch out, and they don't come back. And eventually, if they become painful or too unsightly, you can get some of the surface veins removed. Anemia means no blood. Well, that's not exactly true. If you're anemic, you just don't have enough red blood cells that are working properly. It could be you don't have enough blood cells. It could be you bled out and you don't have enough blood. Or it could be that you have red blood cells, but they don't have enough hemoglobin to do their job. So they're not carrying oxygen properly. You could have sickle cell anemia, where you have the normal number of blood cells, but they're shaped wrong, so they can't go through the capillaries like they're supposed to. So for any reason, you don't have enough appropriate red blood cells. An embolus or an embolism is something that was broke loose from somewhere else and winds up blocking a blood vessel. A thrombus is right where it formed. If it breaks loose, it becomes an embolus, and then it lodges in your brain and you have an embolism. If you have a thrombosis in your head, that means it 
clotted right there. An embolism came from your leg, maybe. Hemophilia, not an a, a incorrect um, association of clotting factors, lacking a clotting factor, bleeding disorder. You can't stop bleeding. Leukemias are blood cancers. It's not made from wort parts. You know, they could, you know, hematocarcinoma or something, they could call it, you know, a, a blood cancer. But in fact, leukemia is the term that they use. Sepsis means the bacteria from a, an infection have made it into your bloodstream and are proliferating in your bloodstream. Life-threatening condition because the bacteria in your bloodstream affect the walls of your blood vessels, causing an immune response in every blood vessel at the same time. And part of your immune response is to cause your blood vessels to dilate, to bring more immune cells there. If all of your blood vessels dilate at the same time, your blood pressure drops and you die. And so sepsis is it's a very life-threatening condition that you have to treat aggressively and make sure that it doesn't get to the point where your blood pressure drops to 40 over 20 or something and kills you. Hodgkin disease is a cancer of lymph nodes. And non-Hodgkin lymphoma is every other lymph node disease but this one. Okay, it's either Hodgkin or it isn't. <laughs> Non-Hodgkin. Infectious mononucleosis, it's related to a, a herpes uh, virus. It's related to uh, called the kissing disease because it, that's an easy way to pass it back and forth, mononucleosis. Surgical terms, angioplasty, what would that mean? What's angio? Blood vessels. Blood vessels in general. Angioplasty is fixing blood vessels. But we normally use that term to mean opening up blocked blood vessels in your heart by putting a balloon in there and squashing everything out of the way and sticking a stent in there so it doesn't reocclude. That's the process of angioplasty. Atherectomy, remember atherosclerosis, is hardening due to buildup of plaques. Atherectomy would be taking a plaque out. One of the main places they do that are your carotid arteries. Older people get atherosclerosis in their carotid arteries going to their brain. And they cut it open and scrape it out and sew it back up so that blood can go through there again. Endarterectomy, inside the artery cut. Removing plaques from arteries. Pericardiocentesis. Well, you'd put a little needle in the pericardial sac and take out some to see what's in there. Is it fluid from a fusion? Is it pus from an infection? Is it blood from a leaky blood vessel? What's the problem in there? Phlebectomy, remove a vein. Phlebotomy, cut into a vein or poke a hole in it. Valvuloplasty, if you have aortic stenosis, sometimes you can repair the valve, other times you cut it out and put in a pig valve or an artificial valve. Splenectomy, spleens are the softest, bloodiest tissues in the world. When you damage one, there's like no way to sew it back up. And so when you people in accidents are always having to have their spleen removed. Fortunately, you can live without it. Splenopexy, if it's starting to sag. Thymectomy, remove the thymus.
aneurysmectomy. That's an easy one. Remove the aneurysm and sew it back up again. Atrial fibrillation ablation, going up in the atria and trying to knock out the places that are causing it to fire so weird. A cardiac pacemaker sends out an electrical signal at the right time to cause your heart to beat at the right speed because your own pacemakers are failing for some reason. A coronary artery bypass graft is bypass surgery. But you'll see it on the chart listed as cabbage. You'll have a cabbage four. That means they had a quadruple bypass. The coronary stent is what they do with angioplasty. When they do the balloon, they stick a little tube in there. Ever, ever put your fingers in those little tubes where you, didn't, you can't pull them out? That's what those stents look like. They're little tiny stents, and they kind of pop open in there and hold the coronary artery open. Embolectomy, removing an embolus, pulmonary embolus. Take it out, the blood will start flowing again. Femoropopliteal bypass. Well, the femoral artery is one of your main arteries going down your leg. The popliteal artery is a little artery that goes across b the back of your knee here, and you can get a pulse in the back of your knee. It's a good, you know, blood vessel to remember for that reason. But what you can do sometimes is bypass a, a blockage in a blood vessel by going from here over to that one, or from that one over down here, so you're bypassing an area of the main artery that may be blocked off. Implantable defibrillator, if somebody has a tendency to go into AFib all the time, or even much worse, ventricular fibrillation, which will kill you in a few minutes because your heart isn't pumping really at all, instead of having paddles, you can implant a device that will detect when your heart stops beating right and shock it back in so you have built-in paddles to keep you going. Intracoronary thrombolytic therapy. What is lysis? Break it up. Thrombolytics are clot busters. Injected in there, dissolves the clot. And here's angioplasty. And we talked about this once before. Percutaneous means going through the skin, transluminal, Cross, crossing the lumen from one side to the other, coronary angioplasty, repair of the vessel. So you're going it from the outside, you're going in, you're putting something across the entire blood vessel and spreading it open to repair it. PTCA, mostly oftenly called angioplasty. Here's a cabbage. There's a blood clot right here. So they take an artery or a vein from somewhere else in your body that you, don't, that you can live without. Usually the saphenous vein, vein about this long running up the inside of your leg. And they snip off a piece and they sew it into the aorta and they sew it into a, the artery past the blockage. And suddenly you have bypassed the blockage. If you only need one or two bypasses, you can use the internal mammary artery. It's about the only artery that you have that you can live without, but it's only, you know, that long. And so if you only need one, and it's better to use an artery because they're stronger. You know, these are coronary arteries. You put a vein there, and it kind of stretches out and fails over time. However, if you use the saphenous vein and eventually it fails, you got one on the other side. You can use that one the next time. Here's the stent. Implantable defibrillator. 
can shock you strong enough to paddle your heart. This one looks like it's set up to shock both the atria and the ventricle. To remove fatty plaque from an artery. What's the fatty plaque called? Athero. Atherectomy. Some other things you might have done. Bone marrow aspiration. In other words, taking out some bone marrow to sample it, to give it to somebody else, or to save it if you're having chemotherapy and it's going to kill all your bone marrow to then put it back in afterwards so it can regrow your own bone marrow. And your bone marrow is primarily in your flat bones. They usually don't take it out of your skull. Usually they take it out of your hip. It's supposed to be excruciating. Take another little break.
Okay, so plenty of diagnostic procedures. Angiography is the procedure of looking at blood vessels. An angioscope would be actually something you can stick inside a blood vessel and look at it. In a lot of cases, they'll take a uh, tube and they'll actually run it up inside your femoral artery and all the way up back into your heart and over the and down into your heart. And they have they can um, inject clot busters. They can inject uh, material that shows up on a radiograph so that it, you can see where it's going. You can put a balloon on the end of it. You can put a scope on the end of it to look and see what's going on in there. So a lot of neat stuff. Um, arterogram, these would be to look at an artery in particular or a vein in particular or blood vessels in general. Echocardiogram is using um, ultrasound. Electrocardiogram, or EKG, ECG, both of them are in use. Cardio that was first invented over in Europe where they spelled cardio with a K, and now we spell it with a C. And so ECG and EKG are the same thing, and that's looking at the electrical activity of the heart. This is the printout, and this is the process. No, this, I mean, this is the machine. This is the printout. This is the process. Sorry. There's an electrocardiogram. This shows the atria beating, the ventricles beating, the ventricles resetting or repolarizing afterward. And if you had AMP1, we talked about action potentials and what's going on. But this is the electrical activity of the atria, the ventricles, and then the reset. And if they look in the right shape and look the same every time, it's a normal heart. And with the EKG course, it'd be nice if there were one run around here, you can learn what all the different shapes tell you about what's going on with the heart. Digital subtraction angiography looks at blood vessels and then takes away all the clutter signal that you don't want to see so that it can focus better on what's there. Doppler is a, a measurement of flow rate. It's based on the fact that things coming toward you compress sound waves, essentially. And when they're going away, they stretch them out. Like a train passing, it goes like that. And so the fact that there is a different compression here than there, you're able to measure and see what the flow is through blood vessels. An exercise stress test is getting on a treadmill or a bike and exercising and seeing what happens to your heart during the, the test. SPECT is a computed tomography um, imaging of the heart. A thallium test, you inject this radioactive thallium substance that then can show up on a spect or on a, even a CT type scan because it glows under the scanner. And so you eject it, inject it, and then you take a scan and you see all the blood vessels it's going through and try to pick out any places it's not. Transesophageal echocardiogram is kind of like the transvaginal or transrectal or trans this or trans that. You stick the echocardiograph thing down your esophagus and you're not having to go all the way through the chest wall to get a look at the heart. The chest wall blocks a lot of that echo um, clarity. And if you go down the esophagus, of course, it wouldn't be very pleasant, but you know, you can look at it a little better. Would you like to come over for some tea? No. No. Cardiac catheterization is where you stick the thing in your leg and you go, and it's a, actually, a, it's not truly a catheter because it, you know, it doesn't remove stuff, but you can inject stuff with it. It's a tube. Impedance plethysmography 
it, it, you're able to look at pulse waves and stuff. It's the same process where you get your pulse on a pulse oximeter, where it, it can tell when there is an increase in the amount of blood, uh, basically, there. And so you can, for instance, in the AMP2, we usually do the, the test where we put an ECG on and put the plasma graph on the finger, and you can tell how long it's taking the pulse to get from the heart to the fingertip. And it tells you something about how healthy your blood vessels are, the velocity of the pulse wave. Blood pressure, pulse, that's just seeing how often your heart is beating and how fast. Sphygmomanometer, sphygmomanometer is the blood pressure cuff. Taking blood pressure by auscultation using a sphygmomanometer and a stethoscope. Laboratory tests, generally blood tests. You can look for C-reactive protein, which is a protein that increases in inflammation. And heart disease actually starts out with inflammation of the blood vessels in the heart. Creatine phosphokinase and cardiac troponin are a couple of things you look for if you suspect the person had a heart attack. If there's damage to heart muscle, some products that are inside cardiac cells and nowhere else leak out into the blood. And you measure them, and if they're elevated in the blood, then the person had a heart attack. Lipid profile, you're looking at to see if your cholesterol or triglycerides are too high. Times I have per minute, the heart is felt. Pulse. We can look at coagulation time to see if your blood is clotting at the, about the right rate. We can do a CBC, which they always ask for on you know, from a life in the ER and Gray's Anatomy and stuff. You get a CBC with differential. Well, it's just a complete blood profile with as many things as you can find on it, and the differential of looking to see the, uh, how, if there's an elevation between white blood cells or red blood cells or hemoglobin levels or whatever. Your hematocrit is the percentage of your blood that is red blood cells. It should be around 40% or so. If it's way high, that's a problem. Too many red blood cells will cause the blood to coagulate potentially, not move as well can cause some other problems. Too low, you're anemic. Hemoglobin, to test whether the bl red blood cells actually are carrying enough hemoglobin to carry the oxygen you need. And prothrombin time is a test for blood clotting to see if you have a clotting problem where it is. Is, it for, it, is there a problem with the clotting factors that are coming through the blood? or a problem with the few clotting factors that are actually in the epithelium itself because they have to match up to form a blood clot. It's a protective mechanism so you don't clot all the time and kill yourself. So, but you can have a problem with the intrinsic factors of the blood vessel wall or the extrinsic factors that are coming from outside through the blood. And prothrombin tests that first step so you can say, wow, they're not clotting but it's a, related to one of the factors that should be coming through the blood. Atrioventricular, cardiac, cardiologist. Hypothermia means you're too cold. Intravenous, that was the first day, right? Hematologists, these people would be, you know, this would be blood study. Not cardiovascular system, but blood disorders. Hematopoiesis is making new red blood cells. Hemolysis, they're breaking apart. Hemostasis, they're not moving. 
Myelopoiesis. What's myelo? Myelo. No, not, that's myco. Myco. Myelo meaning center, bone marrow. Bone marrow. So making new bone marrow. Thrombolysis, breaking apart a blood clot. Leukemia, who did you go to? A hematologist. Or per perhaps an oncologist. You know, who's studying that kind of stuff. Some other uh, terms. A bruit is a noise that's made if the blood vessel is partly blocked. If you're listening to carotid arteries and they're halfway blocked off by plaques, you'll hear little noises referred to as bruits. No bruits in this patient. We suspect they're clear. There's other reasons for their being demented, not because they're not getting blood to their brain. CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Defibrillation means to shock your heart back to a normal rhythm. Diastole is the heart at rest between beats. Systole is when it's beating. So you have systolic, diastolic, systolic, diastolic. When you take your blood pressure, you write 120 over 80. Systolic pressure, diastolic pressure. The high, the low, the high, the low. Extracorporeal would mean outside the body. Extravasation is a term that means you're kind of bleeding out or leaking fluids outside into the tissues somewhere. Fibrillation, quivering of the heart muscle. Hypercholesterolemia, too much cholesterol in the blood. Emia. Defibrillator paddles, the current goes that way and shocks. What a defibrillator actually does is the heart's going kind of crazy and you shock it so every cell fires at the same time and then they all go into their momentary rest period at the same time which gives the SA node a chance to introduce the next beat. Otherwise it's beating but this cell's already firing and this one's already firing and it, it just can't, it can't get them all to pay attention. Like slapping the whole classroom at the same time. <laughs> so they all stop for a second. Hyperlipidemia, too much lipid, cholesterol or triglycerides. Hypertension, high blood pressure. Hypertriglyceridemia, too much triglyceride. Hypotension, low blood pressure. Some old people stand up, all the blood falls to their feet, and they pass out and fall down because of hypotension, postural hypotension. Lipids are your blood fats, cholesterol and triglycerides. The lumen is the whole of the tube in a blood vessel or your intestines or anything. The lumen is the opening. That's not murmur blood, it's murmur. This should be small. Blood is moving through a heart valve, is squirting through because the valve's not open or closed properly. To occlude is to block it off. Systole the, is during the heart is beating strongly. A vasoconstrictor would squeeze your blood vessels to raise your blood pressure. A vasodilator would relax them to lower your blood pressure. And venipuncture is done by a phlebotomist to get some blood out. Anticoagulant, heparin, keep your blood from clotting so you don't form blood clots. Blood dyscrasia, I can't even remember what they meant by that, dyscrasia. I'll look it up. Hemorrhage is just a bleed out. Oh, so just abnormal blood, dyscrasia, okay. Something's wrong with its craze. 
you know, I mean, I'm, okay. So some sort of pathological problem with the blood. Thank you. Dyscrasia. Not used often. I probably would have run across it. An allergen is anything that causes an allergic reaction. The allergist is the person who looks at it. The allergy is your response to an allergen. Anaphylaxis, that's a allergic reaction that is a way overboard re allergic reaction that causes um, sometimes shock, sometimes closing of the airways. It can be lethal. You know, people will have an anaphylactic reaction to shellfish, bee stings, peanuts. The antibody is this little structure your B cells make that sticks onto a bacteria and causes your immune system to identify it and attack it. So you fight it better. An antigen is like an allergen. It causes an allergic response, an uh, antibody response. An autoimmune disease is where your immune system attacks yourself, like rheumatoid arthritis. Your own immune system is attacking your joints. Immunodeficiency, not enough. Phagocytosis, most of, a lot of your white blood cells will actually eat a bacterium, like onychophagia, eating the cell condition, phagocytosis. And a vaccine is injecting you with the dead viruses, so you make the antibodies ahead of time. So if you ever see the live one, you get to fight it quicker. incredible number of these guys. You know, if you're going to go to work in a, any hospital or if you're going to go into the nursing program or something, break these PowerPoints out again, get your book out again, get your CD out again, and go through some of these so you don't have to learn them all along with everybody else who's trying desperately to learn these fast enough to pass a test in the nursing program. Acute coronary system, atrial fibrillation, atrioventricular, the AV valves, blood pressure, bypass surgery, coronary artery bypass graft, coronary artery disease, CBC, complete blood count, critical care unit, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, C-reactive protein, EKGs, deep vein thrombosis, your hematocrit, heart failure, hemoglobin, either with or without the G, it means hemoglobin, uh, intravenous and IV, start an IV line, peripheral artery disease, and MI, of course, a heart attack, myocardial infarction, prothrombin time, and would you like to come over for some tea? Red blood cell, white blood cell. All right. Pain in his calf and swelling in the left foot and ankle. Three days prior, he'd completed a transpacific airline oops, travel, spending several hours in a sitting position. History of varicose veins, he's not had hypertension, high blood pressure, or thrombophlebitis, the Richard Nixon disease, in his history. Uh, revealed a left lower extremity, edematous, that means it has edema, it's swollen. Tender calf, a Doppler ultrasound was obtained, and he has a deep vein thrombosis. So typical, older guy on an airplane forever and blocked the blood flow. He experienced venous stasis. In other words, the blood stopped in his veins long enough for a clot to form. Now he's got a deep vein thrombosis. Uh, Judy and I went to uh, Fiji 
not you know, two years ago now. And on that long flight across, the uh, uh, flight attendants actually told everybody, you know, every once in a while, if you've got nothing else to do, just get up and walk to the bathroom and back. It's the first time I've ever been on a plane when I had people tell me that. It was, yeah, just get up and move around, you know, and, and like every 30 to 45 minutes, what else are you going to do? Play your video games, I guess. Usually not. Young veins are so strong and muscular, they, they don't stretch out and allow the blood to become still as bad as with older people. It could, you know, especially if somebody were obese, um, maybe if they were pregnant, um, you know, anything that might cause some additional problems that some young people do have vascular disease. But vascular disease is usually an old person condition. Hospitalized subcutaneous low 8 heparin, that's blood thinner, you know, or anticoagulant. Coumadin was started for six months, will be monitored, and they're just hoping it's just going to kind of be break up and be dissolved. It hasn't broken loose and caused a stroke yet, and if you inject it with a blood clot buster, it might break it loose, and it does float somewhere before, you know, and cause a stroke. So it's probably better off there than elsewhere. If it were bad enough, they'd cut in and just re remove it. But deep vein, it's not like on the surface. They would have to go in some. So that's what they did. It would be a good idea. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, don't sit at a dining room chair for eight hours. You know, move around. Lie down, get up, elevate your feet, upright, you know, move around and keep the, keep the blood returning well out of your feet. Here's a cardiomegaly or cardiomyopathy. This is where the muscle has been, uh, is thickened from years and years of perhaps, uh, perhaps fighting hypertension or aortic valve stenosis, where it's had to work extra hard to get the blood to pump out, and they become muscle bound. And the chamber gets so small, there's no room in it for blood. And it's one form of heart disease that can kill you. Endocarditis, the inflammation of the inner lining of the heart, which is likely to inflame the valves and make them so they can't open or close properly. Cardiac ischemia. Myocardial ischemia usually starts on the endocardium because the inside of the heart is always getting smashed against the immovable blood before you finally can push it out. And therefore, it gets, uh, its own blood supply gets cut off with every beat. And then it has to re reperfuse during diastole. So it turns off and then back on and off and back on. So if there's any additional problem, that tissue that's already kind of having a hard time getting enough blood, becomes ischemic, it starts malfunctioning, it starts leaking ions, and it changes your electrocardiograph. Because suddenly you're looking at an area where normally there wasn't ion flow, and now it's flowing in a way that changes your EKG. And you can say, wow, this person is having ischemia. They need to go to see their cardiologist. Myocarditis, an inflammation of the heart muscle layer. Pericarditis, with effusion, it's leaking fluid. It's probably leaking it this way, too, but there's plenty of room for it to go there. But if it leaks in, any that's leaking inside is filling up the pericardial sac. Superficial thrombophlebitis is inflammation and distortion of the veins on the surface can come with um, varicose veins, 
deep vein thrombosis is one in the middle of your leg, it's a block. Thrombophlebitis. A hematoma is a blob of blood, so it can form a purpura, a, a, per, a bruise under the skin, or in some places it'll cause a huge bulge. And it's, it's not that his brain is sticking out, there's just blood underneath the skin there. He broke some blood vessels under the scalp and it's formed this blob of blood or hematoma under the under the scalp. Kick mark. I can't tell if he got kicked by a horse or by a person. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't look like a horseshoe exactly. Kick mark. Lymphadenitis, inflamed lymph nodes. Now when I had this lipoma on my neck, you know, there were two things that we immediately looked for. One was to see if it were swollen salivary glands. You know, when you get sick sometimes, they say, well, your glands are swollen. Well, those are your, your salivary glands. You have a pair of them here. You have a pair of them back here. But these guys get swollen up. It's an indication that you have some sort of a infection, a cold, or something. Well, no, it wasn't them. They're farther back. What about lymph nodes? You know, if it's a swollen lymph node, that's not good. You don't want to have your lymph nodes in, involved. Well, it wasn't them either. They're not exactly there, and they're not shaped exactly like that. So we were pretty sure that what we were going to find was some benign lipoma. Lymphoma doesn't show much from here, but it's, that's cancerous lymph uh, disease. Hodgkin's lymphoma, non-Hodgkin's. Splenomegaly. There's the liver. Look at the spleen. Spleen's supposed to be that big. It's not supposed to be that big. Splenomegaly. Aneurysms in the ascending or aortic arch in the thoracic aorta or in the abdominal aorta. This whole thing here is the aorta. had a, one of the most famous and best volleyball players on the U.S. Olympic team ever, had Marfan syndrome. She was 6'4", really long and thin, long hands. You know, it's surprising that somebody didn't actually check ahead of time and see that she had Marfan's. But Marfan syndrome is a, um, a, it's a problem with connective tissue, and she developed an aortic aneurysm that nobody knew was there and died on the volleyball court one day, right in the middle of a match in Japan. She just went plop, and she was gone. Electrocardiograph, the printout. Normal sinus rhythm, if you hear that said, that's good. Normal means it's a normal rate. Sinus rhythm means it's the right rhythm. It's coming from the SA node and it's going the right pattern. So a normal sinus rhythm means that your heart's beating at the right pace and it's all, all the electrical signals are going where they're supposed to. Atrial fib, instead of the atria firing each time to cause the ventricles to fill, instead the atria are going... So atrial fibrillation, the uncoordinated quivering of the atria, and the ventricles are just firing whenever they can manage to because they're not actually getting signaled by the atria like they're supposed to. We did that. Asystole is what they call the flat line. Because, remember, systolic is when it beats, diastolic is when it relaxes. Asystole means it ain't beaten. You're having no systolic contractions. Cardiac 
pericardiac tamponade. It's filled, the pericardial sac is filled with blood. Chronic heart failure. It's been called for years congestive heart failure because you get all congested. Now it's called chronic heart failure, but it's the same three letters. But what happens is your heart fails, the blood can't leave your lungs properly, it builds up pressure in there, leaks fluid into your alveoli, they fill up with fluid and you drown in your own juice. You have pulmonary edema and you become very congested. So congestive heart failure is pulmonary edema. Ascites is if the abdomen fills up with fluid. You see little kids that are starving to death. Starvation causes ascites. It causes fluid to leak out of your capillaries into whatever space they happen to be in, and they get these little pot bellies, even though their arms and legs are this big around. Ascites. Well, when you have can't, I'm not sure exactly the mechanism by which cancer causes ascites unless it causes a loss in hematocrit, a loss in plasma proteins. I mean, the whole problem is that you don't have enough osmotic pressure inside the blood vessels to keep the fluids in. When you're starving to death, you aren't eating any protein and you lose all your plasma proteins. As they deteriorate, you can't make new ones because you don't have any proteins to make them with. And you need the force of osmosis to keep fluid inside the vessels because it's a pulling force. And so the kids, as they lose those plasma proteins, the fluid starts leaking out and they do this. And I would just have to say that if you're, if you're getting ascites from a disease, it's probably causing a decrease in your, in your blood constituents as well. You know, I mean, you, you have uh, cachexia, it's called, you get when you have cancer, you just become, you starve to death. I mean, you're, you get super, super skinny, you lose your appetite, so it may be just exactly the same. Coronary artery disease, atherosclerosis. Mitral valve stenosis, this isn't opening all the way, this isn't opening all the way, you know, if the valve can't open all the way. But this is the aortic valve. Oh, this isn't mitral valve stenosis, this is mitral valve regurgitation. It's pushing backward, the blood is squirting back. It's supposed to be going out the aorta, but instead it's squirting back up into the left atrium. So this is actually mitral valve insufficiency or regurgitation. It looks like aortic valve stenosis. Yeah, it is. It's just the slide is labeled wrong. Varicose veins. Angioplasty. They haven't applied a stent, but they have roto rooted out the, the uh, clot or the atherosclerotic plaque. Atherectomy, pulling out a plaque. Pericardiocentesis going in and pulling out some of the fluid to see what's going on. Phlebectomy, removing a badly varicosed vein to keep it from hurting so much. Phlebotomy, drawing some blood. Valvuloplasty, either using a, uh, maybe a pig valve or a little metal valve and putting it in. Bypass surgery, we saw that. The pacemaker, we saw a, a defibrillator, but the pacemaker sends a signal, 
you know, about it about, you know, 70 times a minute to make your heart beat 70 times a minute. You can have one that stimulates just the atria if they're signaling the ventricles okay. You can have it stimulate just the ventricles if the atria are beating okay but not the ventricles. Or you can have a dual pacemaker that does boom, 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 boom. So you go choo. femoral popliteal bypass, bypassing a block somewhere in your blood vessels, femoral artery in particular, defibrillator, there's our defib paddle, there's the angiography, so this is looking at the blood vessels. Usually you put a radioactive dye in and then you look and see where the blood's going. Exercise stress test. It looks like the guy from Karate Kid. Pop Singh from Bonanza. Cardiac cath going up in the leg here, going right over the arch, down into the heart to do something with the coronary blood vessels. And here's where they're blowing radioactive isotope dye into there and taking an immediate picture so they can see where it's going. If this stopped right here, you would know there was a block right there. All right. Whew. Cardiovascular system. All right, go ahead and work with the terms some. Walk around, take a break as necessary. <laughs>